Surprise! We're taking the Edup Experience podcast to Insights EDU. Join us for an incredible higher education marketing and enrollment management conference February 20th to 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is amazing. Thousands of copies have been sold across the United States and the world. You can pick up your copy today on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Edup Experience podcast, where we do what you know what I'm going to say. We make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio back with you on another episode as we fast and furiously attack. And I mean attack 700 episodes of this podcast in the last three and a half years. Actually, we pro- this, this might be number 700 by the time we release it. I think we're pretty close at this point. Who would have ever thought that we would do 700 podcasts in three and a half years? Well, not me. Uh, but one person that did is my co-founder uh, of the Edip Experience podcast, Elvin Freitas, who keeps me booked out two to three months in advance on the daily, ladies and gentlemen, on the daily. I can't barely get away to run to the restroom when I have a <laughs> podcast facing me. Uh, but that's okay because we fill, my brain is full, we fill your brains with some of the best and brightest minds across higher education and beyond. Mm-hmm. And you are in for a special treat today, ladies and gentlemen, because the founder, the co-founder of the Edup Experience podcast, Elvin Freitas, has decided to make himself seen. And he's going to co-host with me. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Yes! Love Elvin it. Elvin Freitas. I'm back. Hint, hint. Uh, I'll be hint, back. Hint, hint, I'm back. Hint, hint. Yeah. I'm doing great. This is great. I'm very excited. Very, very excited. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. So let's get into it. Let's go. Let's go. You have been looking to the, forward to this for a long time. In fact, in, in fact, um, and our guest doesn't know this, you will call me or text me and say, when's, when's he coming on? Like this episode's <laughs> taking too long. When do we get to have this guy on? Well, the time is finally here. Uh, but before I bring him on, I want to make sure that we cover the format. And so before I say your name, I'm just going to let you know, guest, special guest, this is the way that this podcast typically goes. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And I want to have them answered immediately. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, we can have a good time. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's Larry Kasanoff. He's CEO, Threshold Entertainment, movie producer, author of A Touch of the Madness, out September 2023. And you can get a copy at touchofthemadness.com. Larry, how are you? I'm great. Congratulations on 700. I'm, I'm honored to be your anniversary show. Well, we, we are very, very excited that... Uh, that we hit that and we're very excited more than that to talk to you, Larry. Boy, oh boy, have you done a few <laughs> incredible things in your career. But let's start out at the beginning for our guests and tell us a little bit about Threshold Entertainment. Tell us about your time as a movie producer and tell us about the book. Just tell us about you. So I'm, I'm first and foremost a movie producer as a studio head or as a, as a film producer. I made a Terminator 2, Platoon, Dirty Dancing, True Lies, all the Mortal Kombat movies, uh, Lego Star Wars. We make theme park rides. We made uh, The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man, Star Trek The Borg Adventure, Marvel Super Heroes 4D, and so forth. And we continue to do things like that. So we make Amazing. movies and, um, and theme park rides largely based on huge intellectual property. But a lot of times we, we create new stuff as well. And I, I got to the point recently where I realized, I think that people are more scared than I've ever seen to be truly creative and truly innovative. You just mm-hmm. I just heard so much of my business and other businesses. Well, I don't know, can we do that? I have an idea, but it's a little crazy. And I think crazy is what the world needs more of. And I think a touch the madness is my way of saying to be really innovative, if you really a creative, you got to be a little crazy and just go for it. Because almost everybody I know, maybe you guys do, have some other creative idea deep, deep down. The one that, you know, your your wife or husband will kill you for, your parents don't want you to do. That's the one to do. And that's what I want like to do. Tell them like it is. I like I like that, Larry. What what brings you to that conclusion that we are afraid to innovate or create? What's happened? Well, you know, look, I mean, without getting political, we've lived in a very politically correct world for a long time now. And I, I think it's that, but, you know, I, I have some other theories on it, but it doesn't, I, I came to the point where it doesn't really matter what it is. 
it's like if you have a, you know, if, if you want to lose weight and you, you can ask yourself why you gain weight or you can just lose weight. So the question is, let's solve it. And you can solve it by being, um, by being a little crazy. And, and my book is, is really just a bunch of fun stories from my life in the movie business that illustrate how I, how I use those things. And it's designed to hopefully inspire you to do the same thing. So why? I'm not sure. But, you know, in one sense, who cares why? Let's just change it. Love that. Well, one person that I know loves change is, is my co-founder of this podcast, Elvin Freitas. And Elvin, I want to bring you in, but first, I want to let you know something. You're fired. I've been trying, <laughs> to, trying to find a way. You're fired. To use this. You're fired. And I've been waiting. You're fired. To tell you. You're fired. <laughs> I guess you you're retired. <laughs> you got me, Joe. Oh, my God, I love it. Okay, cool. Well, Larry, first of all, Whoa, 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 whoa. You went by those movies titles so quickly, so quickly. I just want to point out a, a few of the blockbusters that you talked about here. Terminated 2. Judgment Holy crap. 2. Just a little movie that some people may have heard of. Platoon. What? Holy crap. True Lies. Another Holy awkward crap. one. Dirty Dancing, a classic. Come on, man. I mean, who doesn't know Dirty Dancing? Mortal Kombat films. Come on, crazy. That's crazy. Anyway, all right, all right, all right. Let me calm down. He's blown <laughs> his <laughs> mind, Larry. I, he can't contain himself. <laughs> <I'm fine. laughs> oh, this is crazy. All right, but Larry, seriously, you talk about a uh, principle called create, ask, and play. And I think you have some stories about uh, that principle during your time at, with all these different amazing blockbuster hits. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So it's easy to say, okay, just have a touch of that, just be crazy, come up with great ideas. But it means a couple of things. It means not only in the idea, but in your unbelievable willingness to never, ever, 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 ever let go of the idea. So, and, and no matter what, so you have to create an idea. And largely the whole point there is to understand what you're really doing. What's the essence of your idea? Do you love it? Why? What does your audience want? And so forth. But then once you get your idea, you have to figure out I'm not letting go of it because the current of the river of life will try and get every one of us to go towards the middle. It will just always pose towards the middle. And if you let that happen, it's okay, but you won't be great because the world, the audience wants the new and the different. And the best way for the new and the different is innovation and innovation demands a touch of the madness. So here's a story about that. Um, when we did Dirty Dancing a long, long time ago, um, it was a movie that had been started and stopped by another studio. No one really paid attention to it. We mm -hmm. bought it. And it really wasn't going all that well. And we managed to bring in two musical and producing geniuses, one named Jimmy Einer and one named Michael Lloyd, who just, you know, just incredible legends in, in, the, in the music business to oversee the movie. And so once we had that, I was head of production. They were the geniuses behind Jerry Dancing, not me. We said, oh, whew, we got it. And the first thing they did is the song, Time of Your Life, was not the song you hear now. It was recorded as kind of a high falsetto disco song. So hmm. Jimmy and Michael changed. They got a new singer, Bill Medley from the Righteous Brothers. By the way, who didn't? No one wanted to do it. They did it as a favor to Michael and Jimmy, and they and they sent out the new version of the song to all their to everybody, to the management of the of the artists, to the record company. No one liked it. Everyone said, "No, no, no! You got to change it. You got to do this." They all sent in changes, and they all said to Jimmy and Michael, "Will you please make these changes in this new version of the song?" And Jimmy and Michael said, "Sure, no problem. We'll do it all." Three weeks later, they sent out version two with a note. And the note said, listen, we sent this version to some radio stations. In those days, radio stations really helped you promote a song. Yeah. And the radio stations liked it. And everyone wrote back saying, so do we. We love it. Thanks for the changes. That was so great of you. We really appreciate it. This is fantastic. So the question is, using a touch of the madness, what is the genius musical change Michael and Jimmy made between version one and version two? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, here's what they did. Nothing. They didn't make any changes at all. <laughs> they simply changed the label to say version two because they knew what they had. And they doubled down when people said they don't like it, send it to radio stations, which means they're going public with it. They knew what they had, they doubled down. And as soon as everyone heard the radio stations liked it, they all just caved in. And they, they didn't even realize that they didn't make any changes. So if, that's a touch of that in creating. You, you have your idea and you never, ever, ever let it go. You guys were telling me at the beginning of the podcast, that you looked at the way educational podcasts were going and said, no one's fun. Let's change it. I'm sure people fought you on that, yep. but you did it. You're at 700 now. So, so that's the whole point. And th th so how that, you, that's the person. Larry, how do you, so let's take this and somebody's listening to this podcast and they go, oh, you know what? He's a movie producer. He gets to create all day. 
I work in higher ed or banking or whatever, you know what? It's designed not to, to help me be creative or innovative. You know, I, I wrote an article, a higher ed article about our assimilation culture. We have this assimilation culture in higher ed, right? It's hundreds of years old. There's barriers and guardrails. And when you come in with innovation in your mind or creativity in your mind, it sucks. It sucks it out of you because it's hard to make changes. And you find yourself, I wrote in the article, I said, you find yourself going, is this one worth it? Should I mess with this one? No, it's too hard. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that go. Yeah. How do you stick with that idea when the structure around you is demanding that you let it go? Well, th three things. So, so first of all, you would be surprised how uninnovative the movie business can be sometimes. Remember, these, these studios are huge companies. I mean, Warner Brothers still a few months ago was owned by AT&T. They're big, huge corporations and innovation is, is hard everywhere. Yeah. And so the question is, yeah, how do you have that incredible perseverance that the way that Jimmy and Michael did on Dirty Dancing? And the answer is, if you love your idea, you, you really embrace what you're doing, you, you just never, ever, ever give up. And, and the way I think you do that is the, the second point of my create ask play plan is you just ask anybody anything all the time. Now you can shoot as big as small as you want. Here's an example of that. Uh, during the pandemic, we made an animated movie with Universal called Bobbleheads, you know, about creatures whose heads bobble and stuff. And we wanted Cher, you know, famous Cher to play Bobblehead Cher. So not just her voice, we wanted her like this. And everyone said, it's crazy. There's no way you get Cher to do this. She's the most famous woman on the planet. But we called, I called many times, and long story short, we got Cher to play Bobblehead Cher, and she was great. What? And <laughs> exactly. The movie, and so when the movie came out, People Magazine said to Cher, you've never done an animated movie before. Why did you choose this one? And yeah. she said, I've never done an animated movie before because no one ever asked me before. Uh, so can you imagine if Cher, arguably the most, one of the most talented and certainly one of the most iconic women on earth, is sitting there and no one ever asked her in your world, whether you're a, a, an educator, a product manager, a bank manager, whatever, who in your world are you not calling because you're thinking, oh, there's no way. When Cher had never been asked to do an animated movie, you just never know. So, and the way to start doing that is start small. I learned that at school, by the way. I went undergrad to Cornell and I had this great professor who freshman year taught me you can call anybody you want and we used to practice. So maybe you don't call whatever your version of Cher is the first time, I don't know, call your father-in-law and ask how come you can't play the, I mean, he won't play golf with you, whatever it is. Just ask, 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 ask. A million times ask. That, and it's like a muscle. And the more you do it, to answer your question, the easier it becomes. Nailed it. Elvin. I, I want to know more, Larry. Give us more stories, please. More stories <laughs> of, of the create, play, ask principles. And and more stories about the book, too, that, that are in the book. That, that well, I think these are the Go ahead. This is all in the book. And, and, and so the, the third part of this is, I think you got to play. Now, I, now that's the, the creating and the asking, I think, is equally hard everywhere. Certainly, it, it, it's harder to play in some places than another. But in a state of play, you'll be more open minded, you'll be more, you'll be more fun. Um, you, you'll do things you didn't otherwise, uh, you didn't otherwise do. We, we um, we, in one of my, the first movies we ever did, it was a very low budget movie. It was kind of like a Game of Thrones-ish movie way before Game of Thrones, but you know, with one like millionth of the budget. And it was very fun. It was the first movie we were going to do at my first job. And uh, the, my, my boss was a great guy. He said, okay, we want it. We want everything. We want sex. We want violence. We want magic. We want, we want this. We want that. We, we want snakes and wizards. And there were really snakes and wizards in the movie, but it became like a funny cry. You know, our, and, and so as we were talking to the, we were in the studios, we were in the executive producers, as we were talking to the producer, this guy from like a Charles Dickens story in Italy, before I went to start the movie, and we, we would leave every creative development call with, and remember, you know, uh, more violence, more, more magic, more sex, more this, more snakes and wizards, ha ha ha. <laughs> then we came up with a rallying call. So I'm on, now cut you, I'm on the set, my first set in Italy, it's really lovely. And the crew is very excited one day and they have a surprise for me. I don't know what it is. We go out back, we're in Rome and we, you know, the hills are Rome behind us and they're all behind me, but there's nothing there. And then we see a little thing of dust in the distance and then it gets bigger and we see it's a truck. And then the truck pulls up and now they're in a semicircle around me and a band's playing. I'm not sure where they got a band. And the truck backs up and I see it's a circus truck. And the, the back door opens and out come all these people beautifully dressed as wizards with huge snakes around their necks, boa constrictors, 
um, Burmese pythons. But remember, we didn't have any snakes and wizards in the movie. It was a joke. We just forgot to tell the producer we were kidding. And so now oh, the entire crew is unbelievably here. happy. We're drinking wine. They're applauding. And I'm thinking, what the hell do I do? It's my first movie. <laughs> we don't have snakes and wizards in the movie. And so in a not state of play, you'd be furious. How could you spend this money? What did you yes. do? This is yes. state of play. You know what I did? I had another drink and I said, let's put them all in the movie. Yes. <laughs> so, to tell you the Love truth, it. the movie's terrible. I mean, it's really terrible. <laughs> but it it's actually made a ton of money. And the snakes and wizards looks great. So if I were not in a state of play on a set in Italy, can't believe on my first movie, even though it was this one, and and drinking wine at lunch, I probably would. <laughs> oh my god! Cheers. Cheers. I, mean, I love that one. Snakes this and is... wizards should be your cry. <laughs> I love that. Um. So okay, so let, can we talk about technology a little bit, right? Because I think yeah. um, you know AI obviously is the big buzz now, Larry. So so what do you think about technology, AI, and and how um, not to let it serve you and should be the the other way around? Do I look well, like you, I know I'm, what a I'm, JPEG is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of technology in movies. I've done a lot of the nexus of technology in movies. Term T2 was the first movie yeah. to extend use morphing. Uh, uh, our Star Trek. Theme Park Ride was the first ever moving uh, CG camera. Mortal Kombat was the first to move from a video game. We're really, really into that. So, and, and I think that used properly, by the way, AI for movies. I'm not commenting on it for the world. I don't know anything about the world. I know a little bit about movies. For movies, it's fantastic. But you have to use all technology to suit your idea. In other words, decide you want to make the Eiffel Tower and then figure out how to do it versus saying, oh, someone has a bunch of metal rods. What am I going to do with them? In other words, when we made that Star Trek ride I mentioned, it was called Star Trek The Borg Adventure, we wanted to make something, a theme park ride, where you, the audience, could walk through a Star, a Star Trek Borg. For people who don't know Star Trek, that's big space object kind of cube where the bad guys float around in, um, moving. But there were, there were no 3, 3D cameras. CGI, I mean, stereoscopic 3D didn't move in those days. It had never moved before. It was always planted camera. We wanted to do it came up with the idea, we wrote the script, we sold it to Paramount, they said, yes, we didn't know how to, we didn't know, it didn't exist. So now we have an idea and we have to create the technology. We teamed up with a great camera company, we made it and it was the first ever moving uh, uh, 3D shot. It, it started, helped start the Mo craze in 3D, so much so that a studio called us a few months later and said, we're gonna start a 3D TV channel, can you make us product? We said, sure, yes. what do you want? <laughs> yeah, they said, we don't know. We said, well, who's your audience? They said, we don't know. And they said, well, why do you want to do this? They said, this is the new hot thing. Mm. That, in my opinion, is the worst way to look at technology. Don't think, oh, my God, AI, what can I do with it? Think, what do I want to do and how can technology help me? And if you use technology as a tool in your business versus as the driver of your business, it'll work great for you. So AI wor works great. There's a, people don't understand a lot of technology either. There's a lot of things you hear now about Actors worried that they'll be using digital extras. We've been using digital yep. extras for 20 years or digital stunt people for 20 years. You think we made the Spider-Man ride? Someone really flies through the streets of New York? <laughs> but if you use technology to help your goal, whatever your goal is at, at a school or any place else, as opposed to letting technology be the driver, it'll work out great for you. Attention. Are you ready to elevate your institution's marketing and enrollment strategies? Join the EdUp Experience podcast at the Insights EDU conference February 20th to 22nd in Phoenix, Arizona. Don't miss out on this opportunity to hear from engaging speakers from industry leading companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and higher ed leaders. Learn the latest marketing and enrollment strategies to grow your programs. Register now at insightsedu.com and use promo code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Attention. Oh, yeah. Join the movement to mobilize and revolutionize higher education by picking up your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education today. This book has been featured in Forbes, NPR, Harvard Business Review, CEO World Magazine, NBC News, CBS News, and Business Insider, among many others. Don't miss out on what today's highest college leaders have to say about the future of higher education. Pick up your copy on Amazon. Do you, is the uh, movie business, you know, like with higher education, when you hear AI, what, what happened, at least initially, is there was big questions around 
Can you use it? Should you use it? Are students cheating? How do we use it for operations? Is it going to take away our jobs? So on and so on. Is the movie business getting that kind of um, it, that kind of nervous uh, uncertainty around AI? Is are people fearful that it's going to yeah, have it, an all AI movie studio and have no need for for uh -huh. you know, people anymore? Yeah, pe pe people are, and I think they're a little more fearful, honestly, because of movies like T2, because we all come from a history of science fiction where once the computers get too smart, uh-oh for humanity. So yeah. that's a bigger issue that, you know, I, I tend to, in my life, leave reality to politicians and concentrate on fantasy, which frankly is much more fun. But a lot of that is just is just fear. I mean, it's, it's always this way. I mean, people thought people when we started when I started in the movie business, it was home video was a big thing. Everyone was like, well, that's it. Movies are dead. When television came in, they thought movies were dead. When colored movie, uh, television came in, they thought movies were dead. This has been a cry that's happened for the 120 years in the movie business. Uh oh, it's going to be over tomorrow. And it isn't. It, it's just what happens. All these new technologies are iterative. The pie gets bigger and the slices get smaller, but but entertainment grows. So so a lot of people say this for movies. Again, I'm not commenting on non-movies about AI because they don't understand what it does. Because again, when people say, uh-oh, we'll have digital extras, we already have digital extra. Because you, when you go to something and you see 50,000 people at the Super Bowl, they didn't get 50,000 extras and put in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned something new today. I thought there, I thought you shoved 50,000 people in there. No, I didn't really. Do. So, so a lot of this stuff is it, just, is just fear from, from lack of, um, from lack of knowledge. But I, I look at it the other way around. I think it's wonderfully exciting. You know, you can't stop the onslaught of a new technology. If, if it's inventable, it's going to get invented. And so you, again, you better think, okay, well, how can it help me execute my ideas that I've now created that I've asked anyone for? How can it help me do this? So I, I think it's fantastic. The, yeah. the reason, and what, Elvin, sorry, but one yeah. of the reasons I ask is specifically, specifically, <laughs> specifically <laughs> is because of your ties uh, to T2, uh, Terminator 2, where people are looking at this going, I think they told the future. Skynet <laughs> yeah. is coming. Right? Yeah. It's it's going to yeah. be here. By the way, there's a paraglider that just went back here through your window, which was amazing. Uh, Larry's sitting in Santa Monica. Where are you, Santa Monica? Malibu. Malibu. Just his background is the ocean. You see paragliders all over the place. It's a hard life. Well, listen, you know, it's funny you say that because sure, yeah, sure. I mean, if you look at it another way, you know, and, and having, you know, read early versions of the, you know, where T2 was in pre-production, it is this, it, it, creatively those discussions which we once had uh, for a fictional movie are very similar to the discussions that are now being had in real life. And so you so, would sit down and say, what would happen if the machines actually took over? What would it look, the world look like? How would it happen? Well, that, that, would, that was already Jim's script. So, I mean, yeah. you know, T2 was from Terminator. So that had already started that. But yeah, but the talk, there was, I mean, obviously you're involved in a movie like that. You know, it was Skynet was the place where they, you know, the machines took over. So yeah, when would that happen? Would it happen? What do they have to do? Those kind of things you think about all day long, but only in the context of your science fiction movie. Never really thought one day we'd really be talking about it. Well, I didn't, I mean, maybe other people did. So I, but in, in, in that token, um, you know, I, I don't know. That's not, I'm not president of the United States. So I don't really know the answer to that question, so but I, I look at it, I, I think a lot of these things that we have to do, we have to look at and say, What's the good? What can we do right now? And so right now, my job is to give audiences stories that hopefully take them away for a few hours. Mm. And the technology, which is AI, will help me do that. Done. I don't, it's great. So from this, so, you know, a lot of things have been bad. I, I heard at college, I heard a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist speak, and he said, take water. We couldn't live without it. It nourishes the planet. We can't survive without it as human beings, but you can drown in it. So a lot of things have up and down sides to them. I don't think it's unique to AI. I mean, you know, a, a glass of wine a couple of times a week is fantastic. You know, four bottles a day isn't. So I, I think this, it's, it's just from the point of view of storytelling. Oh my God, it's fantastic. It's great. No. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, a fact. No. That's a fact. Yep, yep. George Bush is always right. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, all right, Larry. So what I want to talk about is the title, A Touch of the madness right so talk about why is it a touch of the madness and how can we embrace the madness to become fearless innovators 
So my first job, I wanted to be in the movie business since I was a little kid, and I, I used education to do it. I, I grew up in Boston, wonderful, supportive parents, no money, no contacts in the movie business. And there was this, the oldest high school in the country is in Boston called Boston Lion School. And oh, yeah. it's, oh, yeah. it's an unusual school because it's like a private school, but if you take a test to get in and you do it on the test, you can go for free. So that's what I did. And it was like going to school in the 1800s. I mean, I was not a fan of it, but it gets you into a good college. So I knew that if I got into good schools, I'd somehow make the contacts to get me to the movie business. So I went to yeah. Boston Lion and Cornell and Wharton. And I did, that's exactly what happened. And my first job out of, out of uh, grad school was the head of production of this company called Vestron, which was a new company taking advantage of the growth in home video. So the way home video in the 1980s started was all of a sudden home video stores crept up. There were thousands of them and they needed movies. The same way that streaming that just happened to stream. And all of a sudden there are streaming sites and they need movies. So my first job was to, to, to run production and acquisitions for this company. And I had to deliver 80 movies a year, eight zero movies a year. Make them, buy them, co-produce them. We don't care. Don't lose money or you're screwed, kid. That was my wow. job. And so mostly I, we made like, you know, horror movies, like the one I described with Snakes and Wizards and and yeah. and, and action and rom-coms and things like that. But then I got a script for this movie, Platoon. And Platoon was not one of those movies. It was a very serious script about the Vietnam War and the effect it had on the kids when the tagline was the first casualty of war is innocence. The people in it were not famous. They became famous. And the director I thought was great, Oliver Stone. We had done one movie with him prior. I thought it was amazing, called Salvador, but it didn't make a lot of money. And my boss said, you're, you're nuts, you're crazy. You heard a lot. This isn't the kind of movie we make. And I said, I and find I argued. It's hard to believe. <laughs> right. And, and so, so, and so um, but he said, you know, but look, you're head of production. If you want to do it, do it. But there's always a but. You bet your job. Oh, if it wow. fails, you're a fire. No and he fired it. Right, no pressure. So I, you know, I just thought, well, I didn't get in the movie business to play it safe. I greenlit Platoon, and when I saw the first cut months later, I'm the only person I think on earth to laugh their way through the first screening of Platoon. Not because it was bad, but because I was like, oh my god, I'm not getting fired. It's good. <laughs> yikes, yikes, yikes. <laughs> it was so good, it won Best Picture that year, the Academy Awards. And a few um, months later, I ran into the director of Bar in New York, and he bought me a drink, and he said, you know, kid, I like you. You have a touch of the madness. And I thought, a touch of the madness is a little bit, a touch is a little bit madness is crazy. I mean, is he calling me crazy? Am I crazy? <laughs> then it occurred to me, well, he would have had a touch of the madness for insisting on a Vietnam film that no one thought would work. My boss had a touch of the madness by letting a 25-year-old kid run a 80-picture film slate with no prior experience. And I had a touch of the madness by betting the best job in the world on it. And that's when it occurred to me that this is what you got to do. Innovation demands touch the madness. That's been my, my touchstone and my go-to saying my entire life in the movie business or anything else I, I do. And because, as I said, it helps you swim away from that current that will bring you towards the middle. And innovation demands a touch of the madness. And almost every great project or movie I've done starts out with someone saying, you're crazy. You know, I'm, I'm at the point now where if some, I pitch a movie or a theme park idea or something, and people say, oh my God, what a fabulous idea, that's great. I get a little nervous. If they say, yeah. you're crazy. I, I, I feel this warm embrace, like a misty morning on the beach of a touch of the madness enveloping me. And I think, ah, okay, and I go make it. So that's- Bullseye. You know what's funny about that whole story is that the guy who pulled you aside and said, hey kid, you got a touch of the madness, had a touch of the madness or else he would yeah. never have noticed it. That's exactly right. But you know what's interesting? People often say, well, how do you cast movies? I, it's really simple. I, I look at actors and I look in their eyes and I think, do they have a touch of the madness? And if they do, <laughs> I cast them. And if they don't, I don't. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, you, you, it's how to, part of the book is how to recognize the touch of the madness in others. Elvin, wow. you have a touch of the madness. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Listen, so Larry, this, this is great. I love this. Um, I want to know what are folks in the movie industry talk, uh, talking about when it comes to higher education, is it valued within the industry? Is it even a conversation that you guys even talk about higher education? Like nobody even cares about higher education. Where'd you go to college, but college, this and that. So talk to us about Sadly, sadly no. I mean, when I got my first job, I, I had gone to Boston Land School, Cornell and Wharton. And I thought, okay, I got this job. Yeah, I'm gonna be of course. And, and, and the first day, the boss was a great guy. He said, listen, one more thing. 
you pull any of that Wharton crap, you're out of here. Outrageous, <laughs> outrageous. But the, that company at least was 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 based in New York. You 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 come to LA, you say I went to an Ivy League school. They're like, well, what the hell is an Ivy League school? And we don't care. <laughs> no, it's not valued at all. People don't understand it. They don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. You you it, it's can you make a good movie? Can you not make a good movie? And um. It's it, you know I have a lot of issues with the way film schools are run out here yeah. because I think they 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 teach a lot of the best things that you you should be teaching. But sadly, when you talk about higher education here, it's it's a in my experience, people couldn't care less. Now wow. I think that's wrong because it's still a, I mean you don't just go get a, a good education because it looks good in your resume. You get a yeah. good education. And so in that regard, it's a different story. A lot of people with good educations get hired and get good jobs or do good things because they have a good education. But it wasn't like the pedigree helped them. Wow, that's fascinating because one of the things that Joe always talks about, and I agree with him too, is like, you know, right now a lot of people questioning the value of higher education, but, you know, I'm talking about all these people and their children, like and their parents and they're talking to their children and they're saying, don't go to college. That conversation is, is very hard to, to have to say to someone, don't go to college. So my guess is that even though not ha not education is not very valued or important in the industry, I'm assuming, I'm guessing that's not part of the conversation. I'm sure you know a lot of parents in the industry who have, you know, a lot of people have kids. Are they telling their kids, what are they telling their kids? Like, oh, go to school, you got to go to college, college you have to go to, or no, don't worry about it, kids. You know, just get How does it all work? From the point of view of film school, I think it's changed a little bit because I think a lot of kids now go to film school because it's an easy, fun thing to do and they really have no better idea. And there are times when I sometimes look at some of the interns we have from film schools and think to myself, you know, for what these parents are paying for this school, mm. let's say there's 10 kids, they could all pitch in, they could actually make a low budget movie and they could spend their entire year making a real movie and they would learn 10 times as much as they learned from school. Because sometimes film schools are like trade schools. I, I am in China a few times, I've like at the last minute been taken someplace and realized I've been told two minutes before, I'm now talking to the faculty of a school and I have to tell them how to start a film school with <laughs> warning. And when I thought about it quickly, you know, if I were to start any kind of school, I just say, well, the first thing you have to do is send them to Italy for a semester so they learn art. You have to learn art, you have to learn drawing, you have to learn how to speak, you have to learn how to talk. I'm a big fan of the kind of education I got, which really teaches you how to think, read, write, it teaches you literature. I think that's invaluable. But if you're not going to do that, and you are going to, like, for example, have film school be more of a trade school? How to use a camera? I, I don't know. I mean, there probably, in some cases, are better ways than than going to to school. If you're not, if you're not taking school for what it uniquely can do, which I think is expose you to a bunch of thought and how to think and how to talk and how to write, then maybe it's not. I don't hear people talking about that too much here. But on the other hand, the number one issue we have when we interview kids in film school is I'll say, "What do you want to do?" And let's say the kid will say, I want to direct horror movies. And I'll say, great. What horror movies do you like? And the kid will say, oh, I don't watch horror movies. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. This happens to us all the time. What I used to. Truth over facts. <laughs> <laughs> I used to. Um, I, I, every semester, a friend of mine is a professor. I would go in her class. I would mock interview each kid. And the other kids would vote on whether or not we'd hire them. And the amount of kids who just didn't have any. And they were seniors or grad students. Didn't have any knowledge of the area that they said they wanted to go in was extraordinary. So it's still common. I, I think it's still common. What? I think they, you know, most kids that are going to college have no idea what they're going to do. The, you know, when you look at a college population that serves undergraduates, the biggest chunk of students is undeclared or undecided. You know, can you know what you're going to, what you want to do at 18 years old? That's one of the arguments within the arguments within the industry is should you go to work for a little while and figure out what the heck you want to do? One of the things that I want to ask you about, though, while we have you is about leadership as a movie producer. You are um, conductor, I would imagine, of a lot of personalities, a lot of levels of folks with different functions on timing and projects. How have you and how has your leadership style changed over the years of as you've produced these movies and had to move the parts around? I, I, I think that the basic goal is you're trying to get a thousand people into one creative vision. So I, I do always try and say, do understand the essence of our idea and what's this movie basically about in a sentence or two. So because when you have all these creative choices, you'll, you'll, you'll stick to the path. I do that more and more and more. I think the only other thing that happened is at a point, you know, movie making can get really crazy, tempers can go nuts. But um, several years ago, 
uh, I read about a Zen Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh, who was very well known for bringing mindfulness to the West. And, and, and I thought, what can I do with this? Sounds fascinating, this peaceful Buddhist monk. So I called and asked if I could come meet him because I thought he'd be good inspiration for a Mortal Kombat character. So already that's kind of nuts because I'm thinking this beautiful, peaceful monk is going to be inspiration for a character in my you know, <laughs> action-filled Mortal Kombat movies. But nevertheless, but what happened was rather than him inspiring Mortal Kombat, after two hours with him, I said, oh my God, I feel like I'm on vacation for a, a, a month. How do you, what's your secret? He said, no secret, practice. And I said, I could learn this? Mm. And I thought, you know, the amount of time that on film sets sometimes we waste Screaming, temper is this, whatever is is getting is is too much and non-productive. And so I, I set out to be more of a, I don't mean this in the lofty way it sounds, I'm hardly a Zen master, but a Zen producer versus a bulldog producer. Same goal, but calmer and, and more focused. And that's that's the only that's I've really tried to implement that. Uh, I got, became very friendly with Tignan Han. We became pals. I did a documentary he asked me to called Mindfulness Be Happy Now, which is on Amazon. And so I really have incorporated mindfulness in my life. Doesn't mean I walk around, you know, as a spiritual guru. I'm not. But, you know, it, it, here's, here's an example. You go to the Cannes Film Festival, and it's amazing. It's a gorgeous place, and, and it's incredible. You're usually sitting in a beautiful boat talking about a movie. What could be better? And you get everyone yelling at each other. And after I started working with, with Ty, that's what we call Tignan Han. I, I was in one of those positions and I stopped all these guys and I said, look where we are. Look where we're, why are we screaming? And again, I'm not such a peaceful whatever, but it's like ridiculous. And then everyone kind of calmed down and we made the deal. So that's the way I've tried to incorporate mindfulness more into my leadership style, realizing that, that, you know, one time I said to Ty, well, what happens if I'm making a movie and some guys come in and he's just done something so stupid and it's caused us money and time and creativity. And Ty said to me, your piece is more important. And I thought, well, that makes sense. And then it goes back to the play thing. If you're not in the state of mind to analyze all the other things you're going to have to analyze that day because you're angry at the guy who did something wrong in the morning, I'm going to screw up. So the answer is mindfulness. So you moved to mindfulness from this. Man, I just can't figure out how to tie these nooses. <laughs> <laughs> no, he should tie them mindfully. <laughs> Yeah, a good transition. Yeah, yeah. You're a mindful executioner. Okay, Joe, Joe, I got my, I got my last question. I know we got my, yeah. my last question, Larry. Okay, so let's say um, somebody Wait, has. Before you do that, you got to close oh. out the episode. You're the oh, co-founder. Okay. You got to do all that. Okay. All, the all right, work. cool. All right. So and you're so the producer. Now, so you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you uh, three questions, but let's go one by one. First question, right? Here's my first question. So I got uh, a touch of the madness. How to be more in how to be more innovative in work and life by being a little crazy in my hands, right? I just finished reading the book. I'm gonna give it to somebody, and I'm gonna say, "Oh my God, you gotta read this book because," and you fill in. It's gonna inspire you to be your most unbridled, passionate, creative self. Beautiful. Okay. Bullseye. Fantastic. All right. And so we always close our episode uh, asking two questions at the very end. So is there anything that we've missed, uh, Larry, about the book, about your experience, anybody, you, anything you want to talk about, anything coming up that you might want to mention, you might want to plug, you know, now's the time, definitely plug away. Uh, and two, even though you don't work in higher education, and I'm sure you've been through higher education, you've had a great educational background, I'd still love to know because people who work inside higher ed, they want to know the perceptions of people who are outside of higher ed, right? What do you think the future of education looks like? Well, as I said, I, I was very, very fortunate with my education. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of higher education, but I'm also a huge fan of extremes. So I think if, if you go to school for the reason, like I knew exactly why I was going to school and I took such advantage of it. I mean, in a good way. I mean, I did so much. I, 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 an undergrad, I, I double majored. I ran the school newspaper. I had a job, I had a TV show. I just couldn't believe I got to do all these things. At, at Wharton, you know, when I went to business school to be a movie producer, which they don't teach you, but why did I go to Wharton? Because every day at Wharton, four or five companies come down, make a presentation, have a cocktail party, and you, all day long you're meeting CEOs. And I mean, I had, I, had, I had lunch with the president of France when I was at Wharton. I mean, so, so I'm a huge fan of it if you want it, if you can use it. If you don't, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, twiddling away four years at some school you don't really give a crap about spending your parents' money. I, I'm, maybe there's better things to do, but really good higher education, I, I can't emphasize enough. And still today, I do find, honestly, I'm talking about, I do find a difference largely in kids 
who come from those schools than other schools. So my opinion of it just because, and because of my, my own experience could not be higher. Got it. Okay. What do you, what do you want to plug Larry? Anything you want to plug? Um, um, go to, um, if you like what you just heard, please go to a touch of the madness.com and you can order the book. And I'd love to hear what you think of it. And that's it. Yeah. If people want to connect with you, Larry, what's the best way? Is it the LinkedIn? A touch of the madness.com. Touch of the madness. I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. Larry Casanova. Or, yeah. Well, there you have it, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, before we uh, no, don't see him again for another 699 episodes, <laughs> the co-founder of the Out of Experience podcast, Elvin Freitas. <laughs> yeah! It's been a while Love since it. you hit the mic on a, on a, on a uh, regular episode, Elvin, not at a conference. It was nice yeah. having you around, buddy. Yeah, I love it. Thank you, Larry. This was amazing. I mean, fantastic. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it. All right. Well, let me out to you, ladies and gentlemen. Larry Kassina, CEO of Threshold Entertainment, movie producer, author of A Touch of the Madness, out September 2023, atouchofthemadness.com. Larry, what an honor to have you here. I truly mean it. We've been waiting for this one. We hope you had a good time, too. I had a great time. You guys are fun. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. Oh, yeah. Attention, higher ed marketing and enrollment management professionals. We are taking the EdUp Experience podcast to Insights EDU. Join us at Insights EDU on February 20th to 22nd, 2024 in Phoenix, Arizona. Gain insight into the latest higher education trends and cutting edge marketing strategies that'll take your institution's enrollment to a whole new level. This is your opportunity to connect with higher education leaders and marketing experts from across the country. Comprehensive presentations, engaging panel discussions, and more. Insights EDU will equip you to position your institution for growth. Register now at insightsedu.com and use the code EDUP to save $50 off your registration. Can you afford to miss this conference? I don't think so. Attention. Forbes called commencement the beginning of a new era in higher education, a dispensable touchpoint for what's being said in, about, and around higher education now. Don't miss the insights from 125 college and university presidents about what the future of higher education holds. Pick up your copy of Commencement on Amazon today.